going on guys welcome to the video i hope your days are going great mine's going good and today we got some more news for you guys we're also going to talk about the games from yesterday we had some really good ones but first we're going to cover the xqc situation a little bit more so everybody knows malik forte he's the overwatch league host the guy on the microphone pretty much every time he comes on the camera the twitch chat goes wild they start spamming tryhards it's something that he even addressed on the overwatch league broadcast once and i thought he handled it in a very very good way to me it seemed like personally he never let it get to him so let's go ahead and play that clip where he addressed it if you guys haven't seen yet here it is out there in the twitch chat though would you consider a bastion strat like the one we saw just now at nepal would you consider that a good strat or disrespect you guys let me know in the chat when you're done with all those try hard emotes and in the meantime we'll go ahead and send it over to our casters uber and mr x well, i don't know about you guys at home Matt, but so as you guys can see once again he handled it in a very professional matter he threw some comedic value into it it was good right so basically he's a pretty big part to this xqc band story xqc being racist all that and we're going to cover his tweets about xqc how he responded and we'll just go a little bit deeper into this whole topic on xqc being banned is he racist all that stuff and real quick before the video continues guys drop a subscription on my channel you can see overwatch league videos like this every single day as well click the link down below for my twitch channel i will be live after this doing vod reviews for you guys so if you want a vod review come check that out what it seems like is that the overwatch league is blaming xqc or basically just putting it on him for having the twitch chat spam this emote when he comes on and they look at it as XQC targeting Malik for racism or just being racist in general. And I covered it yesterday. I went very deep into it. I disagree with the Overwatch League. I don't see how they can pin this on XQC. XQC has been spamming the tryhard emote forever in his stream, in the Overwatch League broadcast before Malik came on. So let me tell you guys this. Malik, he was announced to join the broadcast lineup February 7th. XQC, you guys saw in the logs yesterday, was spamming tryhard from day one in the Overwatch League a ton. It had nothing to do with Malik being there. As XQC mentioned himself, it is some type of salute or it has a meaning to him in his Twitch chat. It has nothing to do with race or racism. And I just, I find it ridiculous that the Overwatch League is trying to pin him as a guy that is being racist or has racist thoughts, anything, any form of racism coming from XQC is pretty messed up because his image is really bad right now. It seems like the Overwatch League is honestly trying to force XQC out of the league. They're really just grasping at straws and using whatever they can to make him look like a bad guy and get him out. And I am not protecting XQC. He's made some really bad decisions and he said some awful things. The Muma situation that was terrible, calling people R words constantly on the stream, making fun of other players and other teams. He does it constantly. And I get it, he does it on his stream for comedic value, but he also has to understand he has thousands thousands of people watching him and a lot of his viewers are young and they will go out and attack these people malik personally he's came out he said on twitter he's been receiving a lot of hate messages and xqc needs to understand that he is fueling them to do that he needs to come out he needs to tell his viewers guys relax you cannot go message these guys i messed up take responsibility even if you're not racist we know you aren't you have to take responsibility you got to man up and you got to stop doing these crazy things so now let's just go ahead and look at these tweets from Malik covering this situation, his response to XQC, and the whole situation, basically. For all the folks who slid into my DMs today with love and support, thank you. No, I am super good. This isn't my first rodeo, and I never let these internet shenanigans get me down. Had to acknowledge you guys before giving my opinion, which many of you have asked for. Is the tryhardy moat racist? No. But spamming it when a black person is on the screen and only then is 100% racially insensitive. Rather, that's the intent or not. To me, it's a sly way of saying, hey guys, look, a black guy, he, he, he. It's been happening to me for about three years. It doesn't bother me personally, but it does aggravate me to see how it's been discouraging to many others. All I can say to those people is, look, these stream monsters aren't used to people like me in their esports. They're immature. This is them lashing out, getting cheap laughs, etc. Got criticized for calling the Twitch chat on the moat spam. I feel like my one time addressing this in three years ratio is pretty damn generous. And funny, I never accused anyone of anything. I just acknowledge that I see it. Guilt propelled the whole topic. As far as XQC goes, y'all need to stop coming at me like I was campaigning to get the dude in trouble. When I made me little brief comment on stream, it was unbeknownst to him being in the chat because it's been happening to me for three years. 
My bad for typos, by the way, going fast here. I don't think XQC had any ill intent when he was throwing up that emote. I told him through DM, but dude is in a position where he has a lot of folks that hang on to his every action. I'm not a fan of his follow-up situation. When you make the mistake like this, it's best to take accountability, be quiet. He apparently didn't know that the tryhard spam was used in such an insensitive matter, but trying to defend it as his salute, claiming that people who were angry didn't know Twitch. Well, again, the emote spam was happening before XQC was who he is today. There are many colleagues of mine, black or not, who would co-sign that. So I feel it would have been more respectful if he would have just looked into the situation a little more before going on his rants. His followers ate all that mess up, but I don't think XQC is a racist. I don't think he was attacking me. He made a mistake. So very, very good insight coming here from Malik Forte. I'm really happy that he made these tweets. He's pretty much just nailed it on the tip. Everything is correct that he said. XQC's fans, some of them are very crazy and they're going out and they're defending him to every degree that they can. And because XQC goes on his rants on his stream, flames people and freaks out about these situations and makes everything worse for him because of his fans and his chat. I mentioned this in my video yesterday as well. He's got to understand the power of his chat and fan base. As Malik said, he needs to man up. He needs to own it. He knows he's not racist. We know he's not racist, but just own your mistakes and stop making them, dude. Stop making them. I'm going to do my best to avoid rambling on about this situation because I can go on forever about it. And let's go ahead and move into the games from yesterday. We had some really awesome games yesterday, guys. We started off with the London Spitfire taking on the Boston Uprising. It was a pretty close set. Despite the 4-0, Boston Uprising did put up a fight. We started off on Volskaya. Both teams capped each point. It was just the classic close 2CP match. At the end of the day, though, the London Spitfire did look just a little bit better, and they took it. Moving on to the second map, we had Nepal, which again, another nail biter. 99-99, both rounds. London Spitfire did pick them both up, but this was very close, guys. Easily Boston Uprising could have took Nepal. I'd say this was the best map of the set, and we moved into the third map, which was Hollywood. Both teams, they pushed all the way through. They capped, they had extra time. London Spitfire had two more minutes extra than the Boston Uprising, but still, the Boston Uprising put a great fight up. It was a close map. London Spitfire again, just like Volskaya, they edged it out near the end. They looked a little bit better. So London Spitfire took the set at 3-0. It was really close though. We also saw mistakes coming for Hollywood. He played some Genji, looked pretty good. It's pretty cool seeing them give him some play time. They also were running Kalios on Winston throughout the entire set because Gamsu is out. He is in Korea. And to be honest, for Kalios, someone who has never played that role professionally, he looks pretty good on it. He's not bad. I mean, he actually looks better than some of the other main tanks in the league right now. Like, it's kind of crazy. So good for Kalios. Something interesting. I don't know if this turmoil stuff is true or not. I'm still kind of questioning whether it is or not. I know a lot of you guys assumed it wasn't true after Huck came out and said it was false, completely denied it. But of course he's going to deny that, guys. You got to understand that. Anything that's going to make him or his team look bad at any point, especially something that bad if it got out, would be absolutely no bueno for them. So it would totally make sense that they would deny it like that if it was true or false. Huck also never addressed the fact that there might be turmoil within the team and a bunch of people are disagreeing. He only pointed out that they are not trading or selling Striker, Gamsu, and Nako. You never know. It could be true. It couldn't be. It's a 50-50 right now, but we'll just wait for more news to come out. So London Spitfire, they took the set 4-0. They looked pretty good. They got their vengeance on the Boston Uprising, and that was basically it. We moved into the second set, which was the New York Excelsior taking on the Philadelphia Fusion. This, once again, just like the first one, although it was 3-1 for the New York Excelsior, it was very close. Starting off on Volskaya, it was the typical, again, both teams capped, had time. New York Excelsior just looked a little bit better. Something to also point out about this set, EQO was in for Shadowburn, and he looked pretty good once again, especially for going up against the New York Excelsior. Last week, we saw Shadowburn go up against the London Spitfire, so now we've kind of seen them both go up against the Korean teams, and honestly, it's really hard to tell who's better. I think you'd have to be within the, the management and the team to actually know. At this point, I think it comes down to communication and teamwork. Whoever works with the team better should be the player that plays because honestly, they both perform at a really good level. And it seemed like EQO performed better against the New York Excelsior than Shadowburn did against the London Spitfire. But that London Spitfire game last week was just really rough for them. The London Spitfire looked so good in that set. So you guys be the judge of that. I'm not saying EQO is better but it's a really hot topic right now. It has been for a couple weeks now, and I just don't know. It's honestly up to the team and the people that really know the inner workings. Then we moved on to Nepal, and this map was very close too. The New York Excelsior picked up the first round, then Philadelphia Fusion got the second, and by the third one, the New York Excelsior 
just like all the other maps, just like the London Spitfire and Boston Uprising match, they just looked a little bit better. They edged them out. Going up 2-0, we moved on to the third map. And again, another very, very close map. In Philadelphia's last match against Seoul Dynasty, they were able to pick up King's Row. So I had good hopes coming to this one. I felt they might be able to sneak this one through. Unfortunately, though, New York Excelsior just looked a little bit better once again. It was the same story throughout the day. The Korean teams... They just looked a bit better, and I've been wanting to say this for a while. I think so far in this meta, what is really showing that the Korean teams, they have a lot more discipline than some of these Western teams. These Western teams seem prone to making mistakes. I don't know if it's because they were so used to the Mercy meta, and that it was fine to take heavy risks, and if you got punished for it, it didn't really matter because you would either have a Valk in your back pocket, get rezzed up immediately, or at the beginning of a fight, if you got picked in the back line, your Mercy could just easily res you there. And as for these Korean teams, it seems like they're a lot better at not making mistakes, and they're so much more coordinated with the dive. And I've been wanting to say that for about a week now. The Korean teams, they just seem to understand this meta a little bit more, and know that you can't make these mistakes anymore, because you are really going to get punished in this league for it. Back to the match, though, on King's Row, it was pretty close once again. It was just a close set. Every map was close, but at the end of the day, New York Excelsior, they looked better when it mattered and they came out on top every single time. So the Philadelphia Fusion, they went down 0-3 in this set. Fortunately, though, for the Philadelphia Fusion, they were able to pick up Route 66. EQL, he looked pretty good on the Roadhog in this set. Very surprising. This man's got a big hero pull, something he might be a little bit better than Shadowburn at. He's played the Roadhog, he's played the Widow, Tracer, Genji, Soldier, all over the place, really. Seems like a very good flexible player. Another thing to note, which I almost forgot to mention, they had Dayfly in over Boombox, which is a little bit questionable. I know the Philadelphia Fusion, they like to experiment with their roster, they like to put people in, see what they got, see what they can bring to the team. But Boombox, I think Boombox has really proved over the course of this entire season so far that he's definitely better than Dayfly because Dayfly really hasn't had any good performances yet. Every time they put him in, they lose, and he just doesn't look that great. So I'd be running Boombox. Now let's go ahead and move on to that last set, which was bonkers, dude. Florida Mayhem, Houston Outlaws, what a set. Comparing it to the first match they had in Stage 1, it was so much better. The first one was a 4-0 complete stomp in favor of the Houston Outlaws. Florida Mayhem showed up, specifically to Vic. This guy had the set of his life so far in the Overwatch League. He looked like the player that everybody was hyping him up to be. Damn, his Genji looked good. He was playing great on Farah. He played great on Tracer. The guy was just playing great in this set, and it was super nice to see. We started off on Hanamura. It was the classic once again. Both teams attack. They both cap. On Florida Mayhem's second attack, they were able to get point B ticked up all the way to the very end, and the Houston Outlaws ended up holding them, and Houston Outlaws had about four minutes to cap second, and they failed to do so. They couldn't even get a tick, so Florida Mayhem went up 1-0. They were looking pretty good. Tavik looked great on this map. He really did just start off on fire and never really stop. Moving into the second map, it was Lijiang Tower, which was a very close map back and forth the entire time. But Florida Mayhem somehow found the way to come out on top both times. Tavik, again, I know I've mentioned it twice already, having the set of his life. He, if he could start playing like this every single game, maybe him and Seiya player, they can combine for some crazy... DPS carry. So going into halftime, I'm like, damn, dude, are they going to do it? Is Florida Mayhem going to beat the Houston Outlaws? I'm thinking, this is crazy. What is the Houston Outlaws doing? Are they really falling apart this bad? I think I read somewhere on Reddit. I haven't confirmed this yet, but the Houston Outlaws, I believe they broke the record for the most losses in a row. So they got reverse swept by the Philadelphia Fusion. That was two losses. Then they went 0-4 two times in a row. That's That puts them at 10. Then they started this one off at 0-2. and two, So that's 12 losses in a row. I think they either tied it or might have broken. I'm not sure. But they're up there for one of the most losses in a row. And for a team who was on fire in stage one, I, I don't know, man. I was I was thinking, wow, Houston Outlaws going downhill. And I was also thinking, wow, Florida Mayhem, they're finally going to pick up a set off a team that isn't Shanghai. But I spoke too soon, guys. Houston Outlaws, they prevailed. They came in. The set was still somewhat close. Hollywood was kind of back and forth, but at the end of the day, Houston Outlaws, they edged out. Then we went to Gibraltar, which was a very, very close one. Florida Mayhem should have actually won this. The very last team fight, they played it incorrect, in my opinion. They should have played aggressively. They should have moved forward. There was about 15 seconds left. They should have held up at the choke as the Houston Outlaws were trying to retreat. But instead, they let the Houston Outlaws fall back, completely regroup, and the Florida Mayhem played really passively. They set up in a position and made it really easy for Jake and Muma to come in and dive and kill their entire backline. And Logic and Swoosh got nothing done together. 
and they lost the map. It was very disappointing because that was Florida Mayhem's chance. They really had it there. And again to Vic, and these first four maps played out of his mind. We moved into Elias though, and finally to Vic, he couldn't keep it up the entire time. Couldn't really get anything done on this map. Houston Outlaws, they just look like the better team overall on Elias. And I honestly thought they could have lost Elias too because we know Houston Outlaws track record on Elios isn't very good. Wow, I don't know, what a set it was. It was crazy to watch. Houston Outlaws pulled off the reverse sweep. They showed us that they aren't completely falling off and they're not gonna go all the way down the drain. So we'll just have to see what they could do next week. They are in a very interesting spot. I don't think they'll make the stage playoffs. I'm not even sure if they have a chance mathematically anymore. All in all though, very fun set to watch. I hope Florida Mayhem can start performing like this because this is the Overwatch we need and want. So that's it for the games, guys. That's it for the news today. Thank you for watching the video. If you guys haven't already, please be sure to subscribe to my channel. I upload videos like this every single day. You can get your daily dose of news, updates, scores, recaps, predictions, power rankings, all the good stuff. So drop a sub, like the video. Also, I'm streaming on Twitch all the time now. I'm going to link that down below. As soon as this video is up and you guys are watching this, I will be live on Twitch. I'm going to be doing something interesting today. I'm going to be interacting with you guys, answering all questions and doing VOD reviews for you guys. So if you got an individual VOD review that you want me to come check out, come join the Twitch chat, say hi, what's up, and I will review your guys' VODs. There's also a huge giveaway coming. Join the Discord for more information on that. It'll be coming very soon, guys. Overwatch League jerseys, hats, merchandise, all the good stuff. You don't want to miss out on that. And just thank you for watching, guys. I really do appreciate all the support. And I'll see you guys tonight, tomorrow. Who knows when the next upload will be. But I'll see you guys later. Peace.